On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Chris Franklin, Mr. Brian Chi back on the show today. Now, have you thought about a high fidelity telepresence system for your organization? Well, Google's been working on a project privately that might actually bring it to the masses. But the question is, is it affordable? Now, if you've implemented access control systems for your organization, most likely you've integrated with access systems. Today, we have Rob Druktenis of Access. We're going to talk about edge-based AI and geek out on some IP POE solutions that may save time and money for your organization. Definitely shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 517, recorded October 28th, 2022. AI at the Edge. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Nareva. Nareva has simplified everything about meetings and classroom audio. You get great audio and systems that are easy to install and manage. Visit Nareva.com slash twit to get 50% off one Nareva HDL 300 system for mid-sized rooms when you get a live online demo and buy before December 16th, 2022. And by Sphinx Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the head of your about us box. And by OnLogic. OnLogic is helping innovators around the world solve their most complex technology challenges using OnLogic industrial computers, which are engineered for reliability, even in environments that would challenge or destroy traditional computer hardware. Learn more and find out about OnLogic's 30-day risk-free hardware trial by visiting onlogic.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But I can't b- guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts. Sorry, their very own Mr. Brian Chi. He's net architect of Sky Fiber. He's the network expert, the security professional. He's an all-around tech geek, and he's been working at Maker Faire. Jeepert, how's that coming? Are you guys ready to go? Yeah, we've been, Kathy and I put together 1,030 Learn to Solder kits um, so that kids can learn how to solder safely. And the uh, first teams, uh, first robotics teams are actually going to be running the Learn to Solder. So that's kind of cool. And I'm also getting ready to work with the Central Florida Fairgrounds on upgrading their network. Uh, seems they finally got some funding and we're going to be dropping in some fiber optics and a whole bunch of ubiquity gear so they can support a more sophisticated trade shows. Ought to be lots and lots of fun. And I'm going to be teaching them how to play with fiber. I love that. I love that. Now you sent me some of these and I, so at least I don't have to live vicariously too much through you guys. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to doing this with my kids. These are actually really, really cool kits. Now you guys printed these too. Yeah, yeah, those are custom printed. And uh, the cool thing is, is those LEDs need absolutely no circuitry to change colors and blink. Uh, You actually order them that way and you just apply power and they change colors and blink. It's very cool. Very cool. Very cool. You guys got all the fun stuff. Thanks, Sheber, for being here. Well, we also have to wait. welcome our own Mr. very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He is senior analyst at Omdia, and he is also helping with uh, Maker Fair. Curtis, how that how's that coming? Well, it's coming along pretty well. While uh, Brian and Kathy have been dealing with the uh, small things that people will get a chance to do, I've uh, been with my dear wife doing some very large things. She's been heading up the. Uh, process for laser cutting printing plates that we'll use for steamroller printing at the fair. Uh, Let people uh, ink up the plates, put them down, and then we'll drive a steamroller over it to make your print. So we're doing that. I got a bunch of other things going on. Uh, This is going to be a maker fair. It's going to be uh, heavy with cosplay, with uh, the 
Florida droid builders. Um, we've got the 501st. We've got um, various uh, mercenary groups from Star Wars. We, we just have all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, so we've been busy. All the members of the Maker Effects Foundation have been busy. And uh, it's going to be exciting. we got a, a week-long push before we can finally have the fair and then sleep. Well, thank you guys for being here. Well, we should get started because it's been quite the week in the enterprise. Now, have you thought about high fidelity telepresence systems for your organization? Well, Google's been working on a secret project behind the scenes to maybe make this a reality. The question is, is it affordable for your organization? We'll definitely talk about it. Now, have you thought about edged base access control for your controllers, your readers, your cameras, and all the other uh, devices in your organization? Well, today we have Rob Drucktennis. He's of access, and we're going to talk about all the edge-based AI they have. We're going to geek out on those solutions, those IP and POE solutions to help you save time and money for your organization. So that's lots of exciting stuff and interesting stuff to talk about. So definitely stick around. But we, like we always do, we have to jump into this week's news blips. Point of sale systems are notorious for collecting contact information, even when it isn't needed. The question is, do you hold the same standard for newcomers? Like Square. When merchants signed up for Square, as they means for collecting payments, they didn't realize they were marketing or being managed for marketing material as well. Now, you, you walk up to Square, you put your card in, you tap it, right? Enter your email address for a receipt, and you walk away. Easy peasy. Well, did you realize that at the back end, Square is actually selling your data to merchants? Now, in the case of this protocol story, Compass Coffee here only had to spend $200 for 15,000 email addresses of their customers. Now, Square's ubiquitous card scanners are synonymous with small and medium-sized businesses and merchants, especially mobile ones. Plus, if you want to you know, change or remove your address here as a customer, you actually have to go through hoops to do it. So this way, the next time you use your card that's associated with the email address, it's no longer your actual, you know, actual email address that you use not the one that you dump things into. Now, no normal consumer will do that, but fintech startups and organizations are forced to charge less for their services to empower those small businesses to use them for the flow of currency. That means they need to find other ways to make their money. However, you might have to weigh in on whether your inbox's hygiene for marketing material is worth it for the convenience of low fee payment systems. Do yourself a favor, create a dummy email address for your dumping marketing stuff into it for the future and you know, make sure that you associate that email address with all your retail purchases from now on. Raspberry Robin, a charmingly named bit of nastiness originally spotted back in May, has infected nearly 3,000 devices in almost 1,000 organizations in the last 30 days. That's according to an article at Dark Reading. And Microsoft Telemetry, which picked up the new wave of attacks, indicates the malware is evolving into something new. When Raspberry Robin was initially spotted, it arrived at its point of enterprise entry via infected USB drives and then wormed its way to other endpoints only to remain dormant. That behavior changed in July when Microsoft security researchers saw Raspberry Robin importing the fake updates malware to devices where it's been nesting. Further exploration of the activity revealed some infrastructure overlaps with the infamous Drydex Trojan and the Evil Corp ransomware gangs. Since then, Raspberry Robin has been on a notable role deploying Iced ID, Bumblebee, and Truebot payloads with researchers uncovering a notable spate of attacks in October that have resulted in CLOP ransomware infections. The malware's owners also seem to have become tired of waiting for victims to shove infected USB drives into their computers. New research shows at least four new attack vectors for Raspberry Robin. Now, Microsoft attributes the post-compromise CLOP activity to a group it tracks as Dev0950, also known as FIN11 or TA505, indicating that Raspberry Robin is establishing itself in the wider cybercrime economy. As it enters this wider criminal economy, researchers are unsure whether Raspberry Robin will continue to grow as a tool of its original developers or become a tool for rent to many different criminal gangs. This being the work of criminals, the answer might well be both. So thank you to Dark Reading for this article. and. 
they're basically tooting their horn and waving the flag to say, prepare now for critical flaw in open SSL, according to the security experts cited in the article. Anyway, organizations have now four days to prepare for what the open SSL project on October 26 described as a critical vulnerability in versions 3.0 and above of the nearly ubiquitously used cryptographic library for encrypting communications on the internet. On Tuesday, November 1st, the project will release a new version of OpenSSL, version 3.0.7, that will patch as at yet undisclosed flaw in current versions of their technology. The characteristics of the vulnerability and ease with which it can be exploited will determine the speed with which organizations will need to address the issue. So their headline says potentially huge implications. Well, major operating system vendors, software publishers, email providers, and technology companies that have integrated open SSL into their products and services will likely have updated versions of their technology timed for release with the open SSL projects disclosure of the flaw next Tuesday. But that will still leave potentially millions of others, including federal agencies, private company service providers, and network device manufacturers and countless website operators with a looming deadline to find and fix the vulnerability before threat actors begin to exploit it. Oh, the bottom line is that you're going to need to concentrate on updates now because the OpenSSO module is nearly ubiquitous in the networking world from cameras to firewalls, just about everybody uses it. So update now, not later. Awkward is the word that comes to mind when organizations talk about doing business and manufacturing in China nowadays. Now, with all the latest news from commerce, the FCC, and other big tech companies, it's not surprising the most valuable of them all is weighing their options as well. Now, the U.S. has become more aggressive in its competitive competition with China's domestic tech industry. And signals from Apple, who revolutionized their manufacturing in China, is that they're going to look elsewhere, maybe manufacture. So, good signal from them. Now, in this article from The Economist, Apple is looking for actually India and Vietnam for its latest ventures in manufacturing. Now, giving the growing rift between U.S. and China, it's sensible for Apple to place some side bets before restrictions go any further. And what is also clear is there is diminishing consumer markets within China as well, making it tough to market and sell in there. Now, one interesting aspect of all this is the angle that is Apple is looking elsewhere to contain its costs. As well, that sounds interesting because normally costs are a lot lower in China. Usually the cost-effective way to ensure that you have, you know, maximizing your margins. Well, that's a misnomer. In fact, in 2020, manufacturing workers in China made $530 a month, but the same workers in India or Vietnam made half that income. It's interesting. Now, it puts this, things into perspective, doesn't it? Because, you know, some U.S. workers nowadays actually make maybe three and a quarter to four times as much as that. Now, even though India has had some infrastructure and electrical grid issues in the past, they've worked on developing them and they're making them better for the future. And in fact, their Indian governments are offering incentives and subsidies for companies like Apple. Vietnam is actually doing something similar. They're exercising options for the business and diversifying their manufacturing possibilities can only make the company stronger, in my opinion. Let's hope it also means that other companies will follow suit and do the same, developing greater independence in order to better control inflation. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Nareva. And today's IT pros, they're in a tough spot. The shift to hybrid working and learning means they must equip and support more spaces with audio and video conferencing systems. And at the same time, they're busier than ever with network security, the shift to cloud-based solutions, infrastructure issues, and much more. These factors, along with product shortages and delays, have put an unprecedented strain on IT resources, people, time, expertise, and even budgets. This has driven customers to demand intelligent products that require minimal effort from IT to deploy and manage at scale, with the bonus of requiring zero end user training. When it comes to audio conferencing in larger spaces, it's common to be faced with multi-component systems that are complicated, they're costly to design, they're hard to install, maintain, and manage. Nareva is changing that by offering solutions that deliver a high level of simplicity. Now, with Nareva, you get 
true full room mic coverage and pick up from just one or two microphone and speaker bars. Compare that to the complicated maze of multiple mics, speakers, amps, DSP, switchers, and other components in traditional systems. You can install Nareva systems in most spaces in less than 30 minutes. For larger spaces, it may take 60 minutes, but it's amazingly simple. No special expertise is required. Compare that with installations for traditional systems that can take your rooms offline for days. And some traditional systems may require you to go from room to room to use complicated software. And with Nareva, you can monitor, manage, update, and even adjust all your Nareva systems from a powerful cloud-based platform called Nareva console. Nareva is very scalable for large organizations and their systems cost a fraction of the traditional systems. Now you can get 50% off one Nareva HDL 300 system for mid-sized rooms when you get a live online demo and buy before December 16th, 2022. Visit Nareva.com slash twit. That's N-U-R-E-V-A dot com slash twit. And we thank Nareva for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, do you use Teams, Zoom, even Skype for your business? You probably do, right? Especially if you're a remote worker. I do. I know I use it every day. In fact, I get a little bit of, uh, you know, I get tired of using it. <laughs> it takes a, long, takes a lot out of me every day. I just got off a call before this. Now, what if Zoom was a giant sit-down arcade machine? Would you use it more? Would it be more effective for you? Well, that's what Google has been working on behind the scenes in this latest project called Starline, according to this Ars Technica article. And the mysterious project was announced as part of Google I.O. in 2021's keynote, but then it went dark for a while. While the home console version of Video Chat today involves just a tiny camera, right, in your laptop screen or your computer, Starline brings 3D video chat to life in a 7 by 7 foot sit-down booth with seemingly no regard to given cost, size, or commercialization. Now, the system is very sophisticated. It's got 14 cameras. It's got 16 IR uh, projectors, which actually work together to capture all your movements. They can track in real time. They can create actually a photorealistic version of you. Now, four microphones and two speakers don't just play back your speech, but they also have spatialized audio and dynamic beam forming, supposedly to make the speech sound that's coming out of your avatar mouth sound, look more real. Google is crunching all the data and using a beefy dual Xeon workstation with four NVIDIA GPUs. They're two Quattro RTX 6000s and two Titan RTXs. Sounds expensive to me. Sounds a bit unobtainable for businesses of pretty much any size. I'm not sure what's going on here. The question is, why are they doing this? It's more of a seems to be more focused on a one on one type communication as well. You can't get groups in there. It's, it's, it's not really like a it's kind of like a photo booth, right? So I'm curious. I want to bring my co-hosts in. What do you think is going on here? What, what is Google trying to do with this system? What do you guys think, Curtis? Well, if you ask me, what they're going to try to do is uh, go into the education market. This seems like a great setup for people to deliver online lectures through. And Google has seen its share of the education market grow considerably because so many uh, schools at various levels have embraced the Chromebook as the platform of choice for students. Uh, if you've got lots of Chromebooks in the hands of students, why not have a Google-based lecture pod for the teacher or professor and just go Google Docs, Google everything end to end? That makes the most sense for me because, face it, there are only so many of us who are sufficiently wealthy to have something like that as a home video chat station um, and not that many more businesses who will want to do that for individuals. So when I look at that, I see education uh, with perhaps telemedicine being another good option. It's interesting you said education because this seems to me more like a like a VIP to VIP type communication system because it seems very expensive. What do you think, Jibert? Uh Yeah, I'm, you know, in the background, Burke is guessing in the sixty to seventy five thousand dollar range, and yeah, he's probably right. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to guess because of the custom stuff, it's probably going to be closer to eighty to hundred k to start. <clears throat> now, 
First off, this is not a new concept. Um, I'm going to set the Wayback Machine, you know, honor Mr. Peabody here. And Bell Labs had a video phone demonstration at Spaceship Earth back long time ago. Now, the other thing, too, is I was privy to playing around with a lot of really interesting cutting edge or bleeding edge video conferencing technologies at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications. Um, <clears throat> they actually had one um, that they called a Chautauqua. And the whole idea was they were running very high end video conferencing over multicast. So being able to combine upwards of a hundred participants onto the screen simultaneously using um, tiny uh, thumbnails uh, was a really big deal, but we ran out of bandwidth actually. Uh, even using multicast, it wasn't enough. Now, the cool thing about this is because they're using avatars uh, and they're sending the voice as data rather than an analog signal, what this means is I can easily, easily um, predict that that avatar someday is going to be able to, under computer control, walk into a virtual conference, sit down in a amphitheater, and be able to participate with, in theory, hundreds of people. Um, I think this is going to be one of the things that Google's going to be tinkering with. They're, they are very clearly leveraging some of the work done at the National Supercomputer Center. And I think it's going to be really interesting. So being able to go and walk into, say, a telework center to one of these booths and be able to walk into a virtual conference room, I think is something that's going to be showing up very soon. And I think our friends at Google are going to blow our socks off with this. I, I can definitely tell you the hardware is definitely there to blow our socks off. So I, I can agree with that. Curtis, I want to throw this back to you because I know that you probably want to rebuke my claim that this is too expensive. Well, I think it depends on too expensive for what? Uh, sure. For the individual user? Sure. Um, but for, say, a public university uh, that's already going deeply into distance learning, uh, this, I think, probably doesn't compare very unfavorably to the cost of one of the big multimedia desks at the f uh, front of lecture halls. Uh, so I can see, you know, at worst, I can see one of these per school uh, and letting the uh, online lecturers for that school rotate through it. Um, you know, this seems to be uh, almost a no-brainer. Uh, for that purpose. Uh, and like I said, especially when you tie it to the rest of Google's educational ecosystem, uh, this starts becoming a, a really powerful argument uh, in favor of going, you know, one vendor end to end. Right. Speaking of vendors, uh, there's got to be there's got to be other vendors are doing this, right, Hubert? Actually, our friends at HP have had a competition now for, I want to call it at least six years. Their idea, rather than going with the avatar and digital voice and so forth, is leveraging existing technologies but adding to it. So their idea is make it look like the two sides are in a conference room split by a pane of glass. Make it so that the audio moves wrong. You know, our friends at Nureva, which happens to be a Twit sponsor, uh, is already providing a lot of the digital data on where those microphones are. You know, the digital, the microphone mist that they talk about. So locality information is available. I'm not sure if it's being exported in an API yet. But the guys at HP have done it with a very complex array of microphones. And what they need is they need something simpler like uh, Nureva exporting locality APIs to them so they can move the audio around. That HP conference room, I actually got a chance to look at. <coughs> it is quite impressive. It really does look like the conference table ends. It 
right down to the point where they actually have um, reshaped the conference table so that it doesn't go out of whack with perspective. And it really does look like a conference room where it's split by pane of glass. It was great. Uh, it felt natural. And it's in about the same price range. And on, sadly, it needed to have some very sophisticated installation. Um, the Google concept is really cool. I, I'm predicting it's going to eventually be, um, you know, computer-controlled avatars walking into either a conference room or a lecture hall or something. I think it's going to be uh, targeted at education. But I think we're also going to start seeing a revival of sophisticated video conferencing systems at places like telework centers. Maybe we're going to start having things like this at a copy center like F FedEx Kinko's actually had video conferencing a while when H.320 was really expensive um, and people couldn't even afford the ISDN all installed all the time. So I think we're on the cusp of seeing some really, really interesting things um, being driven by actually the pandemic, you know, more and more telework and suddenly there's a new market. So I'm going to hold my breath because this looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Agreed. Agreed. Well, you know, I want to, I want to throw the curse one more time because I'm curious, you know, a lot of enterprises could use this. Obviously we're, we're reading this article a little bit about obviously Salesforce is thinking about it. They want they signed up for a demo T-Mobile, um, there's Meridian Health. There's there's lots of companies we work, um, and I think Cheaper might have a point here. I mean, obviously these organizations, like for instance, we work. They want to, you know, might want to buy a couple of these and have people come and kind of essentially rent the space to kind of use these uh, for you know important meetings or remote meetings or that kind of thing. So it seems like there there definitely is a market. Would you like you said in education and and this kind of like rent to to use uh, a market as well? Do you think that it, this has a place in the enterprise somewhere? Well, Mr. Lou, uh, Mr. Kurtz, Zoom just dropped, but I'm going to chime oh. in because I have some thoughts yeah. on this very point here. Uh, Salesforce and Zoom and um, uh, WeWork and these other enterprises currently testing this out, allegedly. I don't yep. think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, yes, I know that the pandemic has forced us to think differently when it comes to doing meetings and things like that. And yes, there are times when being in person is going to make a much bigger difference. But should I spend $65,000, $70,000 on a piece of equipment like this when I could pretty much just go jump on a daggum plane and go have that meeting if I really need to get face to face? <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. It's funny that we, I, you know, I was watching uh, Leo. He was trying out the the MetaQuest Pro yesterday. Yeah, obviously the whole I, idea of even advanced VR or with a little bit of um, augmented reality kind of integrated in there. That's fourteen hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks. But I think you know, as these camp, these systems get more sophisticated, they are going to integrate IR systems into them uh, for motion capture, um, for for realism. Um, that kind of thing. And, I, you know, again, if we look at the, the technology that's also in uh, something like Microsoft's AR system, um, it's very similar. I mean, they, they offer this kind of like realistic view of the world that allows you to project yourself uh, differently as well. So I, I think that I think that there might be a, definitely a blend that will come. Obviously, some somewhere in between will come. And there'll be a market for something like this. Uh, but again, like you said, it's 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 a little hard to to uh to swallow when it comes to the current price and the current the current and, technology we'll have to see we'll have to see if they're going to scale wrong. down i spoke about yeah. this on tech news weekly previously you know i've been pitching business here in sonoma county for my photography services and whatnot and i totally get that it makes a difference when i have that zoom meeting with the person right. and i use my webcam versus using my 6k oh man it it's I got them then, you know, just because right. of the, the way things look, everything is a little bit more lifelike and it's more professional. I, I get that. But again, that's not 65 K. Right. <laughs> I didn't spend that much, you know, and now, and we do have Mr. Kurt back by the way. Cool. Welcome back. Curtis. I think I'll throw the, the, the last question to you, Curtis. I, I was just asking Ant uh, about the enterprise applications for this, if the enterprise would eventually be able to kind of implement something at scale here. Do you think that you see the place in the enterprise? 
Well, see, if this is one to one, then it's going to be limited for the enterprise. Uh, if it's one to many, then it's much easier to justify. One to one, I can name, think of some spot uh, applications for it. Uh, things like um, doing depositions for legal cases. I know that a lot of uh, court cases are still being done now via uh, video um, for, you know, non-jury trials. They're finding that uh, going in and doing things by video saves everyone a lot of money and a lot of time. So it's, it's becoming more popular. Um, but for just one-to-one, -one, uh, th this is tough. Uh, I can see this sort of thing being made available to CEOs so that they can deliver missives to the, uh, uh, the minions, uh, or even talk to the board. But, uh, as we've said, uh, one-to-one -one communications, you know, this becomes a really expensive way, uh, of solving a problem that doesn't really exist. Right. Well, thank you, guys. We should definitely move on because we want to get to our guests. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this weekend, Enterprise Tech, and that's Thanks to Canary. Unfortunately, companies usually find out too late they've been compromised even after they've already spent millions of dollars on IT security. Attackers are sneaky. Unbeknownst to companies, they, they prowl the networks looking for valuable data. But the great thing about Canary is that they've turned this into an advantage for you. While attackers browse Active Directory for files and you know file servers and explore file shares, they're looking for documents. They're looking for they're trying out default passwords on network devices and web services, and they'll scan for open services across the network. Things Canaries are designed to look like the things the hackers want to get to. Now, Canaries can be deployed throughout the entire network, and you can make them look identical, identical to a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, or or even a Windows server. So attackers won't know they've been caught. Now, you can put fake files on them and name them ways that can get your hackers' attention. Well, you can even enroll them in Active Directory. Now, when attackers investigate them further, they give themselves away, and you're instantly notified. Canary tokens act as tiny, tiny tripwires that you can drop into hundreds of places. Canary is designed to be installed and configured in minutes. You won't actually have to think about them after that. Now, if alert happens, Canary will notify you any way you want. You won't be inundated with those false alarms. You can get alerts by either email or text message on your console, through Slack, through webhooks, in Syslog, or even just their API. Now, data breaches happen typically through your staff. We know that. We talk about that all the time. And when they do, Companies often don't know they've been compromised. It takes them an average of 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Canary solves that problem. Created by people who have trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks. And with that knowledge, they built Canary. Now, you'll find Canaries deployed all over the world and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit. And for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrade support, and maintenance. And if you use code TWIT in the How to Hear About Us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love your Things Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash TWIT and enter the code TWIT in the How to Hear About Us box. And we thank Things Canary for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today, it's no exception. Today, we have Rob Druck-Tennis. He's from Access. Rob, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, we've, we've been looking forward to this episode for a while because we love talking edge technology, especially some of the stuff that Access has been doing. But before we get to that, our audience is a large spectrum of experiences, and they love to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a journey through tech and what got brought you to Access? Yeah, for sure. So I started in the industry about 24 years ago. Uh, for those of you who may, may know or may not know, started at a company called Northern Computers. They were the innovators of computer-based access control. 
They had a lovely controller called the N1000, and it's a, a workhorse. It's something that still actually runs today. I've actually seen installations that have been done to over 20 years ago. So started in the industry uh, in the access control side of the business with Northern Computers, uh, worked for them for about 11 years, became Honeywell Security, and then uh, after that ended up at some integrators uh, doing product project management, uh, sales, all myriad of different things for a couple different integrators until I landed at Access Communications uh, as a access control uh, specialist. So I've been with the company about eight years now uh, in various roles, uh, in our uh, regional sales roles, uh, and now I'm in a program manager role for access control and focused on our edge uh, controllers and anything access control related that uh, access communications comes out with. So when I think, you know, I'm the software services guy, when I think access control, I think identity and authentication providers, but this is, this is different, right? What, what kind of access control are you talking about? Yeah, access control at a physical level, right? So for those of you who may know, I, you get a badge at your, at your business, you got to present it to what we call a card reader, unlocks a door, right? So that's access control at a level of who can come into my building when and at what time, right? So who can go where, when is the easiest way to think of it. Now, how how has this evolved? Obviously, you know, I've I've had a smart card, smart card based system for a while, where you know you you kind of tap your card to the smart card reader and you can get into the building. But how how has this evolved over time? Because I've had that for probably twenty five years. Is it has right. it changed? What what's 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 what are organizations using now? Like what what is the evolution of that? Yeah, it's funny. So for quite a few years, it was that way of present a card at a card reader, unlocks a door. A lot of it was. Uh, you know, if you've heard of HID, it was a lot of HID card readers and cards that were out there on the market, and, and there still are today. Um, a lot of that uh, is still there, but um, you're starting to see a transition away from uh, presenting a card only, right? So now you're going down the road of card, maybe fingerprint, or some type of biometric along with a card swipe. Or even in some cases, you're starting to see scenarios where they're using Bluetooth. So you open up an app on your phone, you click a, a button on your on your app that unlocks a door. You're even starting to see that in hotels now where, like I ch check into my Hilton uh, app and it says I can do keyless uh, check-in, and then I have a key now through uh, a, a, an app on the Hilton uh, app. So it's starting to transition to a lot of this Bluetooth uh, touchless type uh, credentials, but there's still a lot of that old school present a card, unlock a reader. So it hasn't changed a ton, but it's starting to shift and we're starting to see some of these things now come out and even in the world of QR codes and things like that. Right. Now it's interesting you say that, so these systems are kind of being built together where they have biometrics, they have smart card readers, they have, uh, you know, they potentially have camera based systems. It's kind of like an aggregate of different data points that they're using to help give you entry. Now that sounds like it seems like there's needs to be a lot of connected services for all of that. Can, how does an organization manage that type of thing? Yeah. So uh, a lot of times it's, it's kind of piecing together a lot of different systems. So for example, if you've had a card access system for several years, they may buy another system that's video and try to integrate those two together, or they may go get a, uh, a different card technology. So then they have to replace card readers and things like that. So there's a lot of parsing and bringing things in together and, and, and trying to merge them into one system. But now you're starting to see where people are like, you know what, I really need to, to rethink how I do access control. And some of that comes down to the road of we need to do a rip and replace. I need to get a new server set up. You maybe even go to a cloud scenario. We're starting to see cloud become uh, more prevalent in the access control world. But a lot of it comes back to is almost shifting to um, a, a video management platform even because initially access control was its own solution, its own um let's say setup, right? And then video was set, was separate from that. Well, now we're starting to see video and kind of what Access is, is focusing on is pulling that all into one uh, single planet glass, we like to say, uh, and using the video management system as, let's say, the head end uh, that's driving all the different integrations to access control, audio, radar, you know, all kinds of different things uh, when we talk about uh, uh, merging into a single platform. 
Now, one thing that we've been hearing a lot about, obviously, is the edge computing, like you have, being able to manage some of these things at the edge so that there's less need for connectivity or if there is no connectivity, it can it can, uh, you know, can process these things faster. What, what's happening in that side of the technology? Yeah, a lot of that is um, they're trying to take a couple things, right? So they don't want to have these expensive servers uh, at, at a, a location where they're managing several different locations through one uh, central manager, right? So now they're starting to push a lot of that data processing and all that out at the edge, whether it's access control or even at a camera level, right? So mm -hmm. by doing that, it speeds up the, the responses that they get uh, when someone presents a card. For instance, if I do a fingerprint, that's actually stored at the edge. They're not necessarily going back to a server to grab that data. It's actually stored either on a smart card that you actually have, the data could be on out at the edge, or actually on the device itself. So mm -hmm. a lot of that transition is starting to happen for, for speed for cost because now when we put it at the edge, I'm not running a bunch of cable through the building and trying to interconnect all these different systems. It's just a single network connection out to the door, let's say, if we're talking about access, access control or out to the camera, wherever the camera may be, and then doing all that at the edge and then just simply sending data when needed. Uh, when a customer, let's say, is requesting, what's my log activity? What's, what's happening out at this door? Things like that. It's interesting that they that, that it's moved closer to the edge because when I think about that, I think about the possibility of obviously somebody exploiting that because the data is now stored on a device that's you know closer to the user. It's not you know unobtainable in some kind of server or some database in the cloud. What what is Access doing to secure that type of thing? Yeah, there's a lot of actually a lot of activity uh, on that front. It's it's probably our number one goal now in. in when we release a product is making sure it's cyber secure. So there's several different things. We have secure elements that are actually put on the actual device to, to hold keys to access the data. We also have signed firmware so that if someone tries to penetrate the system and put a spoof firmware on there to gain uh, access to the system, they cannot do that. As soon as it boots up, it'll see, hey, this isn't correct firmware. It shuts it down, right? So cyber secure, uh, security is very important to us, and we find that doing that through whether it's through hardware, signed firmware, or even management of systems. So we have uh, a security management program in the background that checks to make sure everything is valid. So encryption all the way from, if we're talking about access control, from the card all the way up to the server end where there's encrypted data uh, from edge to, to the servers as well. So it's definitely something that's on the forefront and something that we take very seriously when, when it comes to especially devices at the edge that someone can just grab that data and then and, uh, you know do what they will with it, right? Right. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in, but before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's OnLogic. Now, you probably know more than a few feet from a personal computing device that's changed your life. I know I have. I have a ton of them here. Now, there's an entire hidden world of computing that's revolutionizing sustainable agriculture, bringing smart cities to life, and increasing manufacturing efficiency to improve the quality of our lives. And that's where you'll find OnLogic's distinctive orange industrial and embedded computers. Really cool stuff here now. OnLogic is the first choice in industrial computing for innovators around the world who need computing power that can survive and thrive where traditional hardware might actually fail. Now, OnLogic designs and creates computing solutions that can fit in the palm of your hand while powering everything from advanced robotics, AI to manufacturing automation, digital media solutions, and smart agricultural technologies. Now, engineered specifically for reliability, many OnLogic computers are passively cooled and ventless, so they're quiet. They're protecting internal components from dust and other airborne contaminants. The removal of the fans are also results in a complete solid-state device to protect against shock and even vibration. Other design features include specialized components that protect systems from extreme temperatures and interference as well. Now, OnLogic systems are extensively tested to operate reliably wherever they're needed, whether they're monitoring a remote mining operation or riding on a medical cart at a hospital, the team at OnLogic truly cares about creating right fit solutions tailored specifically to solve your unique technology challenges. OnLogic partners with leading software companies like AWS to enable rapid evaluation and deployment of edge computing solutions. For example, OnLogic's line of AWS IoT Green Grass compatible computers have been vetted by AWS, bringing you the peace of mind that will work right out of the box. If you need computing solutions that can be easily configured to your particular needs, supported by industry experts who are just a phone call 
website chat, or even email away and deliver to you quickly. The team at OnLogic is ready to help. To get started and learn more about OnLogic's 30-day risk-free hardware trial, visit onlogic.com slash twit. That's onlogic.com slash twit. And we thank OnLogic for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Rob Drucktennis. He's from Access, talking about all the edge solutions that are coming out, some of the cool technologies happening there. But I do want to bring my co-host back in because they're chomping at the bit here. Chief, I'll go to your first. Actually, I'm I'm going to share a real fast story. I, I used to design command centers. And one of our biggest challenges was access control and video management. They were always separate. And as time went on, there's more and more issues where if someone's doing a card swipe, we wanted to also have the ability to do a tilt pan and zoom of the camera systems so we can get video confirmation, um, especially on very high security installations. Um, previously, getting those two to combine meant a lot of human beings. And that meant we had to staff up during the odd shift, the third shift. Um, it was a pain, but we wanted to be able to go and combine that. How do we get the tilt pan and zoom to automatically go whenever there's a card swipe? It's a lot easier when both systems are integrated. And that's one of the things that started this migration, at least in the Department of Defense, where ACS, access control systems, and VMS, video management systems, started merging. Um, I used to write also for uh, building management uh, magazine, and this was one of the big issues. So here's my question for Rob. Building managers have traditionally been the ones that own these systems. Um, now with more IT involved, it's all networked, it's all um, encrypted, it's migrating more towards the IT world. Um, how how has this been when you know we've got these two different worlds that typically go at loggerheads how are other people getting these worlds to merge yeah it's actually a a challenge and it kind of goes back to my days as an integrator and, and trying to to one sell a system and then two actually set a system up and it was definitely a challenge because there was that shift that's starting to happen where you know, whether it's facilities management, public safety or security departments who always ran that, um, that, that system. And then now they had to pull in the IT department and the IT managers and so on. And a lot of it uh, started to do, had to do with doing that shift from who's going to own the system and now as more and more has been on the network, it's actually pushing towards the, the IT management teams. And there's actually still a battle that goes on, right? Because the, the, the security team or the facilities management team expect one thing and they want it to move fast. Where in the IT world, they're like, well, hold on, hold on. This is going to eat up some uh, network traffic. Uh, I don't know if we're okay with this. We have to go through our security testing and things like that to make sure we're not going to have any cybersecurity issues, things like that. So what we're starting to see is at least at a customer level, I started to see the IT departments actually owning the system and then using the security department as a liaison as to, all right, what do you guys want? What do you expect? And how do we get there, right? So um, getting those two teams to work together, I think, is still a challenge today. Uh, because they both have two different types of expectations and uh, the security department wants more and the IT department says, hold on, we got to make sure this is vetted and everything works well. Yeah, one of the things, uh, I actually been doing a lot of this research because the University of Hawaii security department is actually driving this and it was a big battle. Interesting enough, one of the things that's actually driving the willingness for the two worlds to join together is actually AI at the edge. In the case of the University of Hawaii, it got both sides really enthusiastic when I said, hey, Access has this new capability. We can put in software into the advanced cameras. And a camera that I was proposing on top of a high-rise dorm overlooked a ridge line that was constantly getting brush fires because there's a homeless population that started campfires and you know a stray cigarette or whatever's we start getting these very 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 expensive brush fires 
But if we had the ability to go and detect the brush fires, which happens to be a um, third-party piece of software that Axis is working with, um, we can actually do very early detection of fires. Now, Rob, you sent me a link about AI solving another big issue of walk-behinds. Could you tell me a little bit about the object analysis analytics? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Axis came out with what we call uh, AOA, which is Axis Object Analytics. And what it's doing is it's doing a simple thing right now, some machine learning where it detects a vehicle, what type of vehicle, and a, and a person, right? And what we've had is some applications where a customer has come to us, let's say a large distribution center, that says, hey, when, when a, a, a truck presents a, a car to gain access to my area, I want the truck to pass through, but I want to keep out someone who may tailgate through and walk behind the truck or alongside the truck. And if that happens, I want to be notified. So with using AOA, it's able to say, set up a zone that says, within this zone, I only want a truck to pass through, but if I see a human, I need to be alerted. So what that would do is several different things. I could have a, an audio system uh, alert whoever's trying to penetrate and say, hey, you're under video surveillance, you need to leave this area, or it pops up a video feed in the, the security department, things like that. So that's just another way where we're taking analytics and starting to merge it with an access control type system. Yeah, and you know, one of the things, I've been playing with Axis cameras for a long time. In fact, um, I'll brag a little bit. Uh, the Axis <laughs> folks helped me out, and we got a camera, a Q-series. It's, it's end of life now, but back then it was leading edge. It's the world's deepest webcam. So these um, video, this is actually a library. Um, we've been able to record all kinds of stuff and that's on a q series q6000 series um access webcam so access has the world's deepest three miles underwater they also have the world's highest which actually sits in the iss so that's actually three miles underwater now access has traditionally come out with some really really sophisticated solutions um they're one of the first companies i know that had a I think it was an eight megapixel pan 360 panorama that did a digital tilt pan and zoom. But one of the things that, one of the features that I absolutely was stunned at was how they are, how you guys are merging a radar with a tilt pan zoom camera so that we could actually go and recognize cars. In fact, I'm proposing this for the University of Hawaii so that you can do a tilt pan and zoom and get license plates. So, mm -hmm what other kinds of things are we going to be able to see from access? Uh, you guys keep coming out with these amazing cameras. Um, what has the edge brought for us? Yeah. So right now I, I think from um, things that I can share, uh, you're starting <laughs> to see uh, things in the world of um, the, the, the AOA, right? So we're going to start, we're going to start diving more into using that analytic to, to do things such as um, Q zones or we'll have areas such as loitering. Uh, if, if there's, we already have that where let's say someone sits in a specific area for too long, I need to be notified. So you're doing some preemptive alerting uh, that can then alarm the access control system and things like that. So um, there's, there's even things being talked about such as, and a lot of people are talking about this is, especially in the access control world of, you know, like how you today you can walk up to your car and, and put your hand in the door handle and open the door, right? So you're using uh, UWA uh, for ultra-wide band, uh, ultra band frequency so that you don't have to pull your card out of your pocket anymore. Uh, those are some things that you're starting to see kind of come up uh, into a, a card reader type scenario or access control uh, setups. Yeah, and... I'm actually really excited. One of the other things that we want to go to is how do we handle guests? Because those prox cards uh, cost money. And Bluetooth, while it sounds like a great solution for your employees, it means you need access to that Bluetooth device to um, bring it into the system. You guys are got a really unique use for your AI, and that's QR codes for guests. It's how how well has this been working? Um, do your do the customers like this? 
Yeah, they do. It's it's a it's a nice unique way to go ahead and um, issue a credential through just a simple email. So what we're what we're doing is we go in and create a user just like you would a, a card holder. You put in their email address and then it sends an email to the to the user that says, "Hey, you're you're going to be a visitor on such and such date." Here is a QR code link. You click on it. You install an app on your phone, and then all they do is pop the app open, present it to an intercom that has video, and now they have access to the building. So um, it's another way of issuing a credential that could be timestamped, but you're just simply sending them an email instead of actually sending your credential or going through the hoops of even when you're doing Bluetooth, you have to have some type of sync or pairing that happens. Where on this front, it's just have an intercom at the door with a with a camera. Or you could just have a camera installed at the door, uh, above the door, and they just present their their phone to that to that camera to gain access to the building. Super cool. The world's changing. Um, I, you know, when I found out I could start using my phone instead of having to haul around a prox card, that was really great. Let's go in and talk a little bit more about the edge devices. <clears throat> lots and lots of people say, oh, I'm just going to buy one of those HIK or, you know, cheap, cheap cameras. Why am I buying the more expensive ones? And I said, well, um, do you really value your security? Um, Access has had a program for quite a while um, to allow for the hardening of the cameras themselves. They're running Linux, which is super cool. You can actually add all kinds of stuff. There's actually quite a few third-party developers. But you folks have gone further and started talking about programs to harden. Um, is that handled out of Sweden or is that handled out of the U.S.? Or, you know, how do people get access to um, that information? Yeah, it, it's handled by our, our team in Sweden. They, they, they actually, we actually use a, a third party to even test our systems for cybersecurity, and then they give us a, a report and says you're vulnerable here. These are things you need to button up and things like that. So from that aspect, that's mostly handled at, at a Sweden side. But on the U.S. side, we actually create uh, a hardening guide, is what we call it, and, and it's not really anything really complicated. It's more just best practices because we can provide the secure elements. We can provide the sign firmware. We can provide all these good things, but we still need the customer or the integrator to actually implement some, you know, changing the passwords, setting up uh, 802.1x, uh, right? Or setting up, um, let's say even on a, on a network level that, you know, we don't ha want to have someone to be able to pull an edge reader off and then be able to have access to the system. So you have to harden that connection as well. So there's several different things and steps that we just give them as good practices to actually harden their system. And a lot of these things can just be done today without having any special uh, setups. But the nice thing is, is with an access camera, we actually check those things and actually give you warnings when those things aren't implemented. We actually enable make sure you enable now on a camera an h.ttps H. connection so that it's secure at all times. You know, things like that are all um, things that we find important and that we make sure are implemented in our cameras. Hey, Rob, you know, video management systems and access control systems typically have been just single company. Um, however, the industry is moving towards multi-tenant, and this is yet one more thing that, COVID is nudging along, you know, with telework centers and things like that. Um, what are you seeing in the industry? Is multi-tenant being addressed? Yeah, there is. Um, multi-tenant is being addressed. And, and some of that uh, kind of comes back to, I guess, so for instance, there's another company that uh, Access purchased about six years ago called 2N, and they actually get into some of this multi-tenant or even NDU for residential, where they're really focusing on segmenting those systems, but also having them all under one central uh, hub, let's say, so that they can configure you know, the common spaces and then have the other systems separated out. So it's more done at a software level. Even at an edge level, uh, we're starting to see more um, of going almost to a cloud to make it simple to actually pull those systems in versus having a server and then trying to get networks to connect to each other and talk to each other, going to the cloud and creating a secure net connection that way. We're finding a, is the way that you'd actually start to, to manage these, um, you know, multi-tenant type buildings and so on. So um, it, it's definitely something that's 
coming up more, and I think we're starting to see a transition again. That's part of the reason why I think cloud is also becoming more, impo more important in the access control industry. Super cool. I'm going to do one last tooting of the access horn. One of the resources that um, access has that I am really, really enthusiastic about is their is your learning tools um in fact uh we have the link in it's um access.com en-us slash learning and it allow you guys have lots of stuff um i learned all kinds of really cool things about the ai um capabilities i was really looking forward to learning more about license plate readers um so we could do a head count on and off campus mm -hmm. so what other kinds of things do, does access provide um to help people learn the industry because you know the it world is taking over access control and video management what other things um does access do to help you out yeah, we definitely have our academy team that does a phenomenal job of going out and, and educating our teams, whether it's um, at a regional level where we actually have resources in each uh, business area within the U.S. that they do hands-on trainings and, and actually do overview trainings on technologies and so on. You actually get certifications uh, through those training classes. And then uh, kind of what you're showing here as well is, is our web-based uh, type of e-learning. And, and there's even um, a way that we're finding ways that we're training people even, or it's not even training, but it's more making their lives easier and understanding technology. And that's even through some of our tools. So we have actual design tools that will take you through, well, how do I set a camera up? And when I set it up this way, how do I program the software? So we actually make it easy and say, design the system in our utility and then you take that configuration file and simply pu pull it into our uh, our servers and then everything populates based off of how you sold the project right so there's ways we're even trying to make people's lives easier to, to so that when they sell a system and they put it together and they configure it it actually works the way that they originally designed it so you're not relying on a technician or or someone like that that goes out there and understands something differently and how it's supposed to work it's actually done through the original configuration that, and the way it was sold and designed uh, initially. Right, right. Well, unfortunately, time flies. Well, fortunately, time flies when you're having fun. It's gone really fast. We have a ton of stuff more to talk about, but we want to leave you a little room at the end here, uh, Rob, to talk a little bit about where people could find more about access. You talked about some of the resources. There may be more about some of the edge technology that you've been talking about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you go to access.com, there's a ton of materials which you've already kind of seen. And even uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll find a lot of good educational tools there as well. So several different places that you can actually get this information from, but access.com and then our YouTube channel would be the best places for that. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for being here. We really appreciate you being on this weekend on Price Tech. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You've been, no, you've, well, folks, you've, you've done it again. You've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twia because we're on all of them. Now, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host here, starting with the very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, it's great to see you, my friend. What's going on for you in the coming week and where can people find you? Uh, you know, considering what happened, I think I need to go and put up a mast so I can do a point-to-point -point wireless link to uh, Kurt's house <laughs> a block away. <laughs> yeah, the chat room is, is thinking that you're going to throw some Cat 7 over the wall, too. So we'll see yeah, if that something works. something like that. <laughs> but, yeah, I've actually been playing with this for a very long time. I built command centers, and I've seen the um, market change rapidly. You know, one of my biggest costs used to be in EMT conduit just for the access control systems. I spent a king's ransom on that. But, you know, such is life. Anyway, you know, folks, if you want to hear more about this kind of stuff, throw it at me. I'm on Twitter. I am A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. You're also, by the way, that little orange bucket there. Those actually are um, sandbag replacements. Uh, they're 10 foot and four foot. I've actually got a 17 foot for my garage door. You literally just fill it with water and it becomes about six inches tall and it replaces your sandbags. So sometimes you aren't able to get 
to, you know, whatever in the community to buy sandbags. Um, this one stores nicely. I like it enough that just about every single command center I have built has a bucket of those there. Um, because, you know, having the fire department come in to a classified installation because there's flooding. Yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, I threw that out on Twitter. I'm also more than willing to have you guys throw you guys and girls, sorry, uh, throw email to me. I'm Chebert spelled C H E E B E R T at twit.tv. You're also welcome to throw email at twiet at twit.tv and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your comments. We'd love to hear your show ideas. Um, if you want, throw me questions. We'll be more than happy to take a stab at answering them. Look forward to hear from you. Thank you, Chiever. Well, we also have to thank you very much, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Unfortunately, his internet is not cooperating today, but that's why you have friends like Chiever to harden that. So we'll have to we'll get uh, Chiever on that very soon. But we do want to thank Kurt for being here and all that he does. We also have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise and IT goodness. So if you want to watch and listen to your show and we want to make it easy for you. So go to our show page right now with that TV. That's right. There it is. Twit.tv slash Twite. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes. We've got a lot of them. So definitely check them out. All the show notes, the coast information, the guest information. Of course, the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, right there next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show. Plus, you've also probably heard we also have Club Twit as well. That's right. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. And it's only $7 per month. And the great thing about Club Twit, there's a lot of great things, but one of them is the exclusive access to the members only Discord server. You can chat with hosts, producers, separate discussion channels. There's special events, lots of amazing behind the scenes stuff that we do there, amazing channels, and there are topics for all types of people all types of to to topics. So definitely check it out. Be part of the fun. Join Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, you want to also know that Club Twit offers corporate group plans as well. That's right. It's a great way for, for you to give access to your team to uh, you know give them access to our free tech podcast as well. Plus, the plan is for five members at a discounted rate of just $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you like. And this is the great way for your IT department, your developers, your tech teams to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And just like the regular membership, you also can join the Twit Discord server as well and get that Twit Plus bonus feed. So definitely check out Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, after you subscribe, impress your family members, your coworkers, friends with the gift, of Twy. We're getting into the holiday season. Definitely give them the gift of Twy because we, we have a lot of fun on this show. We talk about a lot of great tech topics that I'm sure that they will find it interesting as well. So definitely have them subscribe and be part of the fun. Now, if you've already subscribed, we are available live. That's right, live, 1 30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. You can go to low it live, go to live, that to it, that TV. There you can see all of our bet behind the scenes. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see us bantering, losing internet connections, me screwing up, all that fun stuff. So definitely check it out live. And of course, you're going to also want to jump into our IRC channel as well, our IRC uh, uh, server at irc.twit.tv. A lot of great characters in there, people who have you know come each and every week, but also new characters each week as well. And we get to a lot of great topics. In fact, they make me laugh during this episode. I have to turn my mic off because sometimes I laugh out loud. So thank you guys for being here. You always make it a lot of fun. So definitely join the chat room as well at IRC dot twit dot tv and definitely hit me up i want to hear from you twitter.com slash lou mm also you can also hit us up at uh twiet at twit tv of course you can hit me on, on linkedin as well send me a message behind the scenes there i'd love to hear from you show ideas topics uh you know enterprise tidbits whatever you want to say i would love to hear from you and if you're also interested in what i do at microsoft definitely check out developers.microsoft.com slash office there we post all the latest and ways greatest ways you can customize office in fact some of the news ways like Office scripts, where you can actually create JavaScript based macros. You can run them in Power Automate, behind the scenes, on a schedule, do it to a trigger, whatever you want to do. Really fun stuff, really awesome way to create integration touch points into your Office documents. So definitely check all of that out. 
I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support this week in enterprise tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you guys for all of your support over the years. Of course, thank you to all the engineers and staff at Twit who can do the show without them. And of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time as well, because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our Tyler's producer. He does all the bookings and the plans for the show, and we really couldn't do this show without him. So thank you, Chibert, for all your support. And of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our editor for today, Anthony. He makes this look good after the fact. He removes all of my mistakes. So thank you, Anthony, for, for fixing all that stuff, <laughs> making it show more seamless. And of course, our TD for today, the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. It's great to have you back, sir. Did you do a hands-on photography this week? Why, yes, Mr. Lou, I sure did. I was able to oh, sit yeah. down with legendary AP photographer, Mr. Kevin Reese. I mean, he's been shooting for well over 30 years and getting shots like what you see right there on the screen. Wow. From the, Is that Larry Bird? The wow, famous Lakers and Celtics finals back in the 80s. Can you imagine wow. being there taking those shots, man? Oh, it was such a great conversation with Mr. Reese. So check it out, twit.tv slash H-O-P. Wow, I'm going on a car trip in about an hour. I'm going to take this with me. So thank you for giving me some content and listen to. Thank you. Appreciate it, Ann. Great, great seeing you, my friend. Well, until next time, I'm Lewis Maruska. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Don't miss All About Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops. Really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, All About Android on twit.tv. We'll